So I am Lisa Savage. I'm a candidate for the U.S. Senate seat currently held by Susan Collins. It's a ranked choice voting election and the primary is Tuesday. So we don't know who our Democratic opponent will be yet, but we're pretty sure it's going to be a very corporate candidate who takes money from corporations and their lobbyists and the PACs that launder that money. I have pledged as an independent Green candidate to accept no donations from corporations, corporate executives, corporate lobbyists. And so I aim to be a voice for the people of Maine in the U.S. Senate. I have been, I'm just retiring from 25 years of teaching school in low income rural Maine. And I have seen even before the pandemic, the families of the children that I work with struggling to survive in an economy that has thrown them under the bus while CEO salaries have gone through the roof. Most of these families are hardworking and they care for their children and they do their best, but they are one accident or illness away from uh, the collapse of their economic arrangements. Um, now that the pandemic has set in, school was canceled, people are um, you know, struggling to pay the rent and keep food on the table. Um, I think that the pandemic didn't create these conditions, but it has shown a light on the stark uh, income inequality in our country and here in the state of Maine. And um, I aim to go to the Senate and be a voice for the people. Um, I've been organizing around climate justice and the particularly calling attention to the effects of the uh, military on climate for many years here. I've been engaged in a coalition uh, waging a conversion campaign asking that our industrial capacity be repurposed to build solutions to climate crisis rather than building weapon systems that exacerbate climate crisis. I also favor a $15 minimum wage, uh, solving the student debt crisis so that the uh, young people can um, you know, start their lives and uh, start a family, build a house and uh, complete their educations without being burdened with debt for the rest of their lives. I do support expanded um, improved Medicare for all, a universal single payer healthcare system, such as all the other wealthy nations have. We've seen how important that leadership could have been to have a national health uh, service at the helm during this pandemic and how much the U.S. has floundered as uh, because we lack that kind of system. And um, I call for a demilitarized Green New Deal because as uh, my uh, fellow candidates here have mentioned, without defunding the Pentagon and without a, a fair tax on the wealthy, we will not be able to find the money for um, any of these social programs. However, the savings in a Medicare uh, for all program would be uh, approximately 30%, it looks like. And the Pentagon really, at this point, gets about 70% of the discretionary federal budget each year. It shows on the books as maybe 54 or 55%, but they hide all the um, nuclear weapons in the energy department uh, budget line. And also the Veterans Administration is its own budget line. I'm certainly not uh, in favor of defunding uh, the Veterans Administration, but I do think we need a realistic accounting of exactly how much American taxpayers uh, devote to the, to the military project each year. Obviously, I'm very pro-education. Um, I think that education, public education has been underfunded my entire lifetime, and I would like to see free public higher education as well. I don't think that students should be graduating from a state university with a mountain of debt. So I thank the Green Party very much for your support and for your time today. We're in it to win it. And under ranked choice voting, we really have a shot at electing a senator for people, planet, and peace. Um, our website is lisaformain.org. So check us out and we'd love to have you on the team. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the organizers of the Green Party Presidential Nominating Convention for inviting me to speak here with you. It has been a longstanding safari tradition of my family to service others. I fought to improve our community's groundwater systems away from toxic plumes, saltwater intrusion, and E. coli. I fought to help save our surface water ecosystems from plastic, raw sewage, dioxins, and other calamitous pollutants. But while I've done everything I can at home, the status quo in Washington has been just that, a status quo. I am running for Congress because I am renting the earth from my children. I, as a father in our community, know how challenging it is to provide safe, constructive experiences for children during a pandemic. Parents cannot compromise on healthy and peacefully stimulating environments to transition our families to. Most of our government officials have been assuming the status quo is the answer you need. 
Governor Cuomo won't enact the stock transfer tax, which would provide $8 billion to needed local school districts following the revenue loss caused by the pandemic. Cuomo doesn't want to raise taxes on his billionaire contributors and has avoided any discussion about the stock transfer tax solution. Instead, he is cold-heartedly betting on low and middle-income people living in frontline communities, picking up the tab instead of the profiteering billionaires. Congresswoman Kathleen Rice has voted in support of every military budget increase, voted unfavorably in response to Trump's increasing authority over the military, and has never signed on to the Green New Deal. If elected, I will serve our people in ways that most people never have the courage to. If elected, I will prescribe a COVID-19 economic stimulus package that embraces the Green New Deal, a commitment to transition to zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, combined with an economic bill of rights that raises the living standards for all Americans. This would include a guaranteed living wage job and income, single payer health care, and the right to quality housing and free education, including college. A recent study by Oxford University shows that a green economic stimulus is far more cost effective in creating jobs than traditional infrastructure projects. Climate change poses an existential threat to the future of life on the planet. The two corporate parties have wasted the last three decades. We need to radically transform our country's energy and political system in the next decade. The House Democratic leadership this week proposed another three decades for a partial reduction in emissions, while the GOP focuses on prompt protecting the profits and wealth of the fossil fuel industry and the financial backers. Even more progressive Democrats like AOC have failed to call for a halt in new fossil fuel infrastructure or a ban on fracking. The Democrats still focus on, on increasing profits for private investors with schemes like carbon capture and sequestration and promotion of biomass helping factory farming. In 2012, our city of Long Beach, New York was inundated with raw sewage and tens of thousands of us were displaced as a result of Superstorm Sandy. Democrats just give this issue lip service, including the need to help third world countries survive the crisis industrial polluting nations have caused. Mind you that low income and frontline communities have always been disproportionately and negatively impacted by this perpetuating climate crisis, COVID-19 and police brutality. If elected, I will fund our Green New Deal proposals with a 75% cut in the military budget, higher taxes on the wealthy, and a robust, robust carbon tax starting at at least $40 a ton and I hope that you share this campaign and join us as we raise high the banner of social justice principles, protecting the quality of our environment and human rights to change the world now. Please join our cause at josephnaham.com. Uh, when the Green Party of Utah asked me to run, it definitely appealed uh, because I'm doing a lot of the work that I believe the world uh, needs already. And I believe that through the political transformation that this country needs, we're able to better elevate um, the solutions that are really all around us. Um, I think it's really important that more and more political people that choose to run are ecologically educated and know what it's going to take to heal the soils, protect the water, protect the air, and also really encourage um, a culture of, of mutual aid, a culture of taking care of each other, a, a culture of resiliency. Uh, running for county mayor is a really big seat. This is the capital county, it serves over 1.1 million people. And it's a really amazing opportunity to be able to pull um, Salt Lake County together and share a vision of what I like to call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Uh, so much would change for us when it comes to social justice, political transparency, and ecological health if we really take the time to focus on the foundations for what creates a truly healthy uh, a really healthy world and healthy people, which is really founded in the way we interact with our environment. Uh, coming from the background of an urban farmer and gardener, I've been advocating for those types of solutions for the last nine years. I've started nonprofits and I work uh, diligently to help people learn how to grow their own food. Uh, I believe Salt Lake County could produce uh, 40 to 50 percent of its own calories. Uh, we have a big heritage, a pioneer heritage, so to speak, here in the county, uh, where we used to produce almost all of our own food um, as uh, Mormons and even further back with the indigenous people um, of this uh, valley. And so I want to bring a resurgence to that and, and help people realize that if we are resilient and self-sufficient, if we're able to feed ourselves and take care of each other and untap the potential of our communities by more intentionally coming together and sharing resources uh, for a brighter world, um, this vision, uh, by running for such a large seat and for putting my heart into this, um, I believe those uh, those visions, those programs, those um, the, the way that we're 
creating those changes are going to be elevated and it's a no it's a no lose scenario it's a great opportunity to be running for the green party i believe that um, the two-party system is unable to produce the kinds of systemic changes that we need in the world and so the energy of this campaign is meant to create change now um, regardless of the outcome and also to be a pioneer for more millennials more progressives more people even with tattoos to step into the field and say there's a better vision out here and we need to be authentic and we need to be uh, transforming the political system getting money out of it bringing transparency back i'm running against a, an incumbent centrist democrat um, that just doesn't have the capacity to make the bold changes that we need in the world so thank you for this opportunity for uh, having me here today um, I'm Ann Wilcox. I'm running for a city council at large seat in Washington, D.C. Um, it's an open it's an open seat this year because one of our members is, is stepping aside. So I, along with uh, three other ballot candidates and a number of independent candidates are running for the seat. Um, I'm a longtime member of the Statehood Party. And back in the 1970s and 80s, we founded the Statehood Party to push for statehood after our home rule, which is limited home rule, was given to us by Congress. And we did have city council members with the statehood party back in those days. Then in the 1990s, the statehood party merged with the Greens, so we're now called the statehood Green Party, and have continued to maintain our ballot status through this entire time. Uh, we haven't gotten back on the city council, but we have had two uh, school board members, and I was one of those school board members who served for a, a four-year term, and we've had a number of uh, neighborhood commissioners who are all statehood Greens, so we've had some success on the local level. Um, my own background, I'm uh, from Ohio originally, another Midwesterner, but I came to Washington, D.C. as a student, really liked uh, D.C., and went to law school here. So I'm a longtime public interest lawyer. I've done, you know, landlord-tenant uh, law, worked with protesters quite a bit. I'm active with the National Lawyers Guild, which is another fellow traveler organization for the Greens, um, and uh, have been a longtime community activist, as well as serving on the school board, as I, as I mentioned. Um, the uh, program we're running on this year, the platform, is of course center statehood because DC is making some progress toward achieving statehood. We had a vote in the House of Representatives just a couple of weeks ago, which is the first time the statehood bill has ever passed in the Congress. Now, of course, the Senate will be an uphill battle, and then it had the bill would have to get signed by the president, uh, which of course this president would never do, but there is some hope for the future. Um, the Statehood Green Party is also our progressive party for D.C., so of course we oppose gentrification, which is becoming a huge problem here, as well as in places like San Jose. Um, we're for affordable housing, uh, more health, health equity. Uh, we propose a Green New Deal platform, which is energy conservation and all of those issues, and basically opposing the rampant development, which most of our uh, political power power brokers are very much behind developers and they're funded by developers. So uh, for example, this week I put out a press release calling for some of that development money, which really is subsidized by the city council to be shifted over to funding public housing repairs because public housing is falling into disrepair and children are living in you know, conditions of mold and vermin and so forth. So we need to put more money into our public housing and shift money away from some of those development projects. So that's kind of what we're, what we're about, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. This is really exciting time. I mean, we're in the middle of a, a net global pandemic, and we're still campaigning on progressive values as a way to show the community what perhaps we were missing. So again, my name is Jake Tonkel. I'm running for city council here in San Jose, California, specifically for District 6, which covers the west side of San Jose and is particularly impacted by our development and growth, especially coming up where we have Google creating one of its largest new campuses right on the edge of the district. And then as we discuss how high-speed rail for California makes its way into San Jose and then into the Bay Area. Uh, so we've really centered this progressive coalition, you know, like you said, gathering support from many of our local labor organizations, um, the Green Party and, and even many Democratic clubs in Santa Clara County, we've centered this coalition around equity for the city of San Jose and for the district. Uh, as a city that has almost 94% zone for single family residential, we're one of the largest but most sprawled cities in the country. And as we develop, especially around some of these new projects, 
gentrification and displacement are becoming more and more of an issue that we are really failing to rise to the occasion of and prevent. Um, we have in San Jose, the fastest growing inequality of any city in the country. And in Santa Clara County, which we reside in, uh, home to the largest gender pay gap and the largest wage theft of any county in the country as well. So we are continually struggling with kind of the epitome of inequity with tech and then low wage workers where four out of every, four low wage jobs exist in San Jose for every one low wage housing unit. We're really struggling to make sure people can stay here. And until we make changes to represent people, uh, implement publicly funded elections, things like ranked choice voting, overhaul our community to, um, engagement process so that we can get more voices at the table when we decide what development looks like, we're gonna continue to struggle as a city. San Jose uh, sits in a, a space where we don't even talk about uh, Democrat versus Republican very often because the council is uh, generally and the Bay Area generally very democratically run, but we do have labor versus chamber as the divide for city council. Uh, right now we are on the edge where the business uh, development sector has six votes versus five votes that are progressive in labor. And we're up against uh, you know, one of the more conservative members on council. This is the opportunity for us not only to change how district six and its residents interact with the office and get to have a voice uh, on city council, but for the city as a whole, flipping this seat will have massive implications for how we move forward, for how equity is pushed uh, at city hall. And I'm extremely excited to be able to continue that conversation through the next few months on to November. My state rep office runs along eight mile road made famous by M&M but Ferndale also has a distinction of having uh, Affirmations, which is a lead LGBT organization here in Michigan. I can walk one house to the right and I can see its front door. Uh, the seven communities that I'll be running in are all familiar with me. I've been exploring this for a year and a half, attending their city council and commission and township board meetings school district meetings before and since I was running for the State Board of Education. I learned so much about education in Michigan that I wanted to use it somewhere and state representative is a natural because they're supposed to be funding it according to the Michigan Constitution. What is also, there are so many things tied in with education. I have a four leaf clover symbol I'm running with. So it's public education, it's public transit, it's prison reform, and it's protecting families, and all of that is so intertwined. I did some research, and Michigan spends $34,000 per prisoner per year. For that amount of money, someone can attend University of Michigan tuition, books, and room and board for a year, or they can get one of two years of skilled trades training. Both two years would be for less than what we pay for a prisoner. And the amount of money we have per student is like less than a third of what we pay for prisoners. So we definitely need to have some reorientation of those things. What I have here with these quote, lower offices is we have two people, two Greens running for county commission in those the same districts. One of them's, one of his county commission district is totally within my state rep district. So we can run together. People, we see two Greens on the ballot in those lower offices. And the other person is three square miles. She's a disabled veteran and she has much she can talk about She's done a line by line study of the county commission budget. We have excellent candidates and we are working together. This is what I call a farm team so that ultimately we can, we can get elected at this level and we can keep moving upwards to do more than just raise issues, but also get elected. I'm also working this time with having our candidates across the whole state go after endorsements, Sierra Club, union endorsements, 
if it does nothing else, it will tell them for probably the first time. So I respected the endorsements that I heard from another one of our candidates who got the AFL-CIO. I'm working on them. And they need to know we're here. They need to know that we're on the same side and they're not going to find that anywhere else. I'm also working with our Peace Action and their national organization person came around a couple years ago and he said, you need to consider green candidates, especially for Congress, correct? And I'm sitting there saying, this is what I'm doing here, letting them know that the Green Party exists and it is an option. So as you can tell, I am just excited about the possibilities that we can do at these local offices. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks for coming. Hope you're all are well. I am Dr. Justin Paglino. I've never run for office before. As Gloria said, I come from a medical and a science background. Uh, I have an MD and I have a PhD in virology. I'm here because I believe we all deserve health care. And I want to work to see that we get Medicare for all. Howdy, folks, and welcome to the Green Wave Candidate Showcase, brought to you by the National Coordinated Campaign Committee. This is the spot where we'll be having conversations with some of the most exciting Green Party candidates happening anywhere in this election cycle. And we're going to kick it off with an exciting candidate, uh, longtime Green Party organizer, Craig Cayetano. Craig, welcome to the Green Wave Candidate Showcase. Thanks for having me, David. So uh, before we begin, let's just and honor the passing of a great uh, Green Party activist, Kevin Zeese. Craig, I understand that you knew Kevin. Yes, I've known Kevin for a few years now, and both Kevin and Margaret Flowers have been amazing to the Green Party of New Jersey. There's been numerous events, and I've had the pleasure to meet them, speak with them, uh, even you know, spend some good time up at uh, the Salem A&M together, and my heart and condolences go out to their family. Yes, as do mine, and Greens and social change agents and lovers of peace, justice, democracy, and ecology all across this country and the world. Craig, I do want to give you an opportunity uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself. And I, by that, I mean, who are you and why do you do what you do? <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, so for everybody that's uh, just getting to introduce myself, I'm Craig Cayetano. I've been involved with the Green Party of New Jersey since 2016. I'm also uh, current one of the current uh, co-chairs of Green Party of New Jersey. So. I decided to get involved um, after reawakening during the whole progressive movement with Sanders and then moving on and realizing in New Jersey, we definitely need to take the Green Party serious and we need to build this as a progressive vehicle. And honestly, you have to be the change. So I got involved in 2016. Uh, I was supportive of Jill's campaign. And then obviously in 2017, we ran amazing campaigns for Seth Copperdale. 2018 that rolled on with Madeline Hoffman's uh, bid for U.S. Senate, Diane Moxley for uh, CD7, and then I decided that I was going to run for office. I had uh, spoken with another uh, comrade of ours, Bruce Dixon, and you know he gave me the, the, the talk I needed to realize that it was really time to see what I can do on, uh, in the power that I can wield and, and try to build this party. And I'm, I'm proud of the work we're doing in New Jersey. Our state party has grown. We have over 10,600 registered Greens. Well, and I want to stop you there. You're up to, you're over 10,000 registered Greens now. Correct, yes. Congrats. Let's take a moment to really acknowledge what that means. That's 10,600 folks who have made a commitment to peace, justice, democracy, and ecology. So congratulations, Craig. Thanks, David. And it's great because we've become more diverse. You start to see a whole new energy that comes into the state party. And I have a lot of friends and I respect all my friends that are politically active that have tried to work, you know, their ways and try to reform the Democratic Party. And regretfully, the way the machine works here, it doesn't always pan out. And we still are, are friends. We still are in coalitions together. But if we can keep growing, if I can win my town council race, if Madeline can, you know, triple or quadruple her votes from 2018, if Howie and Angela can get, you know, five to 10% of the vote in New Jersey, that's really going to elevate the whole conversation, the ceiling, and that'll break us through here in New Jersey. And I look at it as measured wins. 
So I, I love know. how you're talking about that, Craig. And I want to take a moment to get really do a bit of a deep dive because you're running for Hawthorne Town Council in New Jersey, Ward 3. Tell us a little bit about that specific race and what issues you're running on. So in Hawthorne, we're a nice North Jersey town. Uh, what most people are probably not aware is on local levels, you're not going to see too many people that are really standing for something. A lot of the people that run for office are just running on their name. They don't really have a platform. Myself, I, I'm not a coach. I don't have that in. I, I don't have a family, so I don't have that in with the community. So I got my name into the community by joining my green team and environmental commission a few years back. We've uh, done some great work there, and I was able to help propel that and help uh, you know get some notoriety that way. I'm also part of our county SPCA, and I think that's a good entry point, but there's so much you can only do there, and you really need to take it a little bit further. So I think on local levels, in North, North Jersey at least, our candidates need to have a platform. Our candidates should be willing to sign the No Fossil Fuel Pledge like I have to commit to not taking any corporate money, PAC money, fossil fuel. I even go out and say I won't take any real estate or developer money. The problem you run into in local politics in North Jersey is you start to see a lot of businesses try to get into the town and into the council and maneuver some policy certain ways. This happens right next door in Patterson, and a lot of people are tired of it. So as a candidate, I just wanted to make sure that I'm going to adhere to the values I believe as being a green. So, Craig, I hear you saying that you're running an absolutely corporate free campaign, a clean campaign. So you're not bought. You're not for sale. I also heard you very specifically talk about a pledge for no fossil fuels. Talk a little more about that. What does that mean? So the Greens obviously are, are running, you know, to not be beholden to anybody except for the, the people they serve. There's a lot of other groups out there that have started to come out with pledges and they do have amounts. So as a green, what I always do and on my videos, on my photos I put out there, I cross out the amount. No $200, it's $0 as a green. Even the Green New Deal pledge, I give a lot of respect. There's a lot of youth involved in the Sunrise Movement. It's grown here in New Jersey. There's a lot of good activists in it. I sign their pledge, cross out the money, and make sure it's zero there as well. Because our Green New Deal is going to take it way beyond, obviously, what we know that the, they nationally try to propose in terms of the Green New Deal. The Green Party's Green New Deal is the true Green New Deal. On local level, we can take our town and make it sustainable. My goal would be to get the town sustainable by 2030. And do you have a plan in order to take the town of Hawthorne to sustainability? Definitely. New Jersey is known as an environmental or activist state. They do have money out there for grants. It just takes the right person with the right fire to get in there and apply for that money and use it on a municipal level. There's no reason why we can't put solar on our borough hall, our municipal pool. That can power the pool. There's a band shell down there that can take care of all that there. I believe in trying to get off of, you know, utilizing traffic and safety. So I have uh, called for more bike paths. Bike paths. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do on a local level, too, which most people aren't aware of. And that's why they need a candidate like myself to, I think, bring it forward. Well, Craig, thank you so much. It's an exciting campaign that you're running and New Jersey Green Party uh, on the move. I want to give you an opportunity for any final thoughts. Of course. I'm going to give a shout out to my friend, Madeline Hoffman. Madeline's been running hard. She ran in 2018. She's been running her campaign here against Cory Booker. She is the progressive to endorse. I hope all my friends here can donate to Madeline Hoffman for Senate. I also give credit to Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker working a unity ticket. I think New Jersey has to be realized as a safe state. It's going to go blue. The outcome's already determined. There's no reason why we cannot get 5 to 10% of the vote, and it's still going to benefit our campaign and our overall goal to try to make 5% national. So I give shout outs to those campaigns. I want to thank everybody that's been supporting me since last year running for office and helping me out this campaign cycle. We're committed to winning. We're going to do everything we can to try to get in front of the community despite the ongoing COVID crisis. And I just look forward to talking to anybody who uh, reaches out to me on social media or says hi when I'm out on the street. 
And I just look forward to seeing everybody. So you can check us out at Cayetano4Council.com, on Facebook at Cayetano4Council, Instagram as well, and on Twitter at Green4Ward3. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Craig. And folks, again, I'm David Cobb. You're watching the Green Wave Candidate Showcase. Craig Cayetano running for the Hawthorne Town Council Ward 3 in New Jersey. Uh, next, we'll hear from longtime Green Party organizer Howie Hawkins. Of course, as Craig mentioned, uh, Howie and Angela Walker are the presidential and vice presidential ticket uh, this year. Just a, an acknowledgement that Howie is really one of the co-founders of the National Green Party movement. Uh, he is one of the co-authors of the entire concept of the Green New Deal. And we have a pre-recorded message from Howie Hawkins coming up next. Hello, Greens. I want to talk about the importance of local elections, because I think that's how we're going to build the Green Party into a major party in force in American politics. It's a big secret in American politics that Green Party in its history has elected over 1,200 people, mostly the local office, a few state legislative offices. And if we're going to become a major party, we got to start electing thousands. And that's what we need to do as we go into the 2020s. And we need to do that now because the Green Party is needed more than ever. The climate crisis continues. COVID is not being solved. Inequality has been growing and life expectancies are declining for working class people. And we need peace initiatives to stop this race toward nuclear war. And a good thing about local races is we can win them because the playing field is much more level. Big money doesn't help as much as getting out there and talking to the voters and letting them get to know you as a candidate. And that's uh, a lot. That's all you need sometimes to get their votes. So one of the major purposes of our presidential campaign is to get ballot lines so it's easier for us to get on the ballot for local elections. And so, you know, we're coming up to this election this year. You know, if Trump wins, despite the COVID health and economic crisis, the Democrats can't do anything. And if Biden wins, progressives are going to be disappointed. In either case, our time is coming. But it starts with these, this grassroots effort to elect thousands of local Greens as we go into the 2020s. Good luck. Hello. Howdy, folks, and welcome back to the Green Wave Candidate Showcase. I'm your host, David Cobb, and a reminder that the Green Wave Candidate Showcase is brought to you by the National Coordinated Campaign Committee. Uh, and in fact, this is a fundraiser for the Candidate uh, Coordinated Campaign Committee, and it's important work that they do because they provide training for candidates and campaigns via monthly webinars and conference calls. They provide direct financial support to specific candidates through an annual competitive process. And most exciting to me, the Coordinated Campaign Committee conducts in-person campaign school trainings in collaboration with state green parties. So it, it, it is not too much to say that the Coordinated Campaign Committee might well be the single place where the rubber meets the road for most of us because of the direct support they give to local candidates like Craig Cayetano, who you just heard from, and like my personal friend, Paul Patino, who is joining us now. Paul, welcome to the Green Wave Candidate Showcase. Thanks for having me, David. So, you know, Paul, uh, look, I know you personally, and I've known you now for 15 years as a fearless uh, uh, advocate, not just for the Green Party and as a successful uh, elected official, uh, but somebody who has been like doing the work day in and day out. Uh, but I want to, just like we did with Craig, give you a chance to introduce yourself on a personal level. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why is it that you have dedicated so much of your life uh, to the Green Party and serving as a local elected official? You know, uh, I started as a Green in 2000 with uh, Bush and Gore want to make me Ralph. <laughs> and I just, uh, you know, I, I people were so adamant to me. They said, 
how can you do that? Uh, he can't win. You're throwing your vote away. And I said, you know what? I'm making a choice like I do throughout my life to do the right thing. And the Democrats and the Republicans are not the right thing. And I think we all need to, as the, as the walk away campaign says, we all need to walk away from both parties. <laughs> well, well said, Paul. And, and uh, of course, you got elected and have been uh, elected multiple times uh, in a college town. Uh, and uh, I got to say, it's always amazing to me to see how many young people are just like hanging out with you. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I also want to acknowledge the role that you played in having Arcata, California, which, by the way, the first Green Party majority uh, city council anywhere uh, in the country. But, Paul, you were instrumental in bringing down a presidential statue before the recent Floyd rebellions. Say a word or two about that. Well, you know, about uh, I, I was elected first in 2004 and around 2006, the idea came up and we had a green majority at that time. It was the second green majority uh, on Arcata City Council. And I, we, we couldn't come to uh, an agreement on pull the statue down, put a plaque up. It, it got really mixed up. And then, nothing, of course, nothing happened. So when the opportunity came up again, and I was on council again, I thought, you know, I'm not going to let this pass by. I'm going to stand up right away and say, let's take it down. And let's see where the chips fall. As it turned out, the council voted a majority to take it down. And then there was a petition from uh, one, the minority member of the council to uh, keep it. And the town voted 72% to back us up and for it to leave. And so it was just an opportune thing. It felt like the right thing to do at the at that time. And, uh, you know, I guess I had some future sight. You know? <laughs> well, you certainly did. And it wasn't just uh, the incredibly profound uh, action of taking down the McKinleyville statue. But, Paul, you've also been a fearless champion for houseless people uh, in your tenure, uh, fighting against the, and I don't know how else to say it, but that sort of, liberal mafia uh, in Arcata that pretends like they're progressive, but they're really neoliberal. Uh, but you fought back against them. And uh, the reality is that there is a public toilet available on the Arcata Plaza, frankly, because of you. Uh, and I'd like to, you to uh, say a word about the what it means when you're actually an elected official about what you're able to do, things like that. Yeah, you know, uh, for me, because... It's been a little, many years. I, when I ran in 2004, I thought, what, what can I unify in this town? What do we need here? And it always, it just kept coming up to me. We don't have a public bathroom for anybody. And so I put it at the top of my wish list in 2004. I wasn't really well known. I, I was on the city committee, but not, I, I hadn't been elected before. And 99 out of 100 houses said, we need that bathroom. And I was so surprised because it was from the expensive houses down to the little trailer parks. Everybody wanted that bathroom. So when I lobbied for it, um, I knew I had support. I got off council before we got around to doing it. Okay. You know, again, thwarted by lack of will on the council. So I got off. As a citizen, I started lobbying the council. I said, you have to do that bathroom to the point where I said, if you don't do the bathroom, I'm going to run for council again. <laughs> and so <laughs> on. And, the, the, and Paul, but, you, know, you actually, of course, have been elected multiple times. You're currently the vice mayor of Arcata. And you do something that continues to shock me because you're not just an advocate of campaign finance reform. You take a particular approach to campaign donations. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. It's, it's basically no money. <laughs> it's really simple. Uh, the forms are simple. You don't have to report anything. 
All you have to do is a lot of leg work. And, you know, COVID has got me pinned, pinned down. So we'll see what happens with this election. It'll have to be all virtual. But uh, normally I just, I'm a door-to-door, on-the-street person, and I'm, I'm very vocal about the things I want. I, I always have a list. And, you know, not, not taking money, ads, endorsements, no signs. It's such a relief. It's scary, but it's a relief. And, well, uh, Paul, you talked about the issues that you have. I also want to give you an opportunity to talk about your what I think is an amazing idea for a genuine participatory common interest committee. Because for folks who don't know, Arcata is home of Humboldt State University and the so-called town gown, the you know municipal city folk uh, versus the university can be a real problem here. You proposed something that is incredibly visionary. Talk to us a bit about the Common Interest Commission. For me, um, in order for this, the city and the university to work together, you have to have the leaders of both of them meeting on a regular basis and talking about something that's important. You need to include associated students, and you also need to include the community. And for me, having that committee, well, the university is 8,000 people plus employees in a 18,000 people town. So it's very powerful. And, and, and Paul, been, I also want you to touch base on your ch- how you're championing a low-cost solution to the houseless crisis. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the situation here in California is, there's money for housing. There's no money for camping. There's no money from the state or the feds to do any kind of campground, a transitional thing that's not a building. And the housing costs here are so high, one apartment is what or you could do a whole tent campground. So I've seen Dignity Village and Opportunity Village in, in Oregon, and I think we can do that here. And in fact, in the COVID crisis, we went as a city, our city manager stepped out with our backing and created a homeless campground sanctioned by the city and two parking lots in town. We're the only city in the whole county that did it, was successful. The community in mass thanked us for doing it. You know, the population wants to do something for the homeless. It's the people in charge that can't get their act together. So it was it, it was an opportunity for us to see how could a campground work? What could we do? And so the next step for me largely is now to push for a legal campground uh, of the opportunity type, opportunity village type. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, Paul, it's uh, the time just sort of flew by with you, but I do want to give you the uh, same opportunity for any final closing thoughts. You know, I just want to I want to thank the Green Party for having existing so that I can be somewhere in between Democrats and Republicans so that I can actually go and vote and say, that's where I want my vote. And, you know, the rest of the world, the universe runs on its own as long as I do what I think is best, I'm fine. And the universe is fine with me. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, it it does remind me uh, of a quip that I sometimes share. And that is, you know, uh, the Green Party, uh, the very fact that we exist is something to note because this system with ballot access and um, corporate controlled media and a relentless uh, effort, they make sure or work hard, not just to prevent the Green Party from succeeding, uh, they try to prevent something like the Green Party from even existing. So the fact that we have secured ballot lines, the fact that we have elected literally thousands of people at the local level and continue to run candidates at the local, county, state, and federal level um, is a testament to our vision for a different world. And Paul Patino is somebody who is served as an elected official and has championed 
uh, actual concrete policies. I just want to thank you again. And I want to remind viewers that you're watching the Green Wave Candidate Showcase. And this Candidate Showcase is important because it is a fundraiser for the Coordinated Campaign Committee. Remember, the Coordinated Campaign Committee trains candidates by monthly webinars and conference calls. The Coordinated Campaign Committee provides direct financial support to targeted candidates through a annual competitive process. And most exciting to me, the Coordinated Campaign Committee helps to conduct in-person campaign school trainings in direct collaboration with state and local green parties. So if you are inspired as I am, I'm inviting you to join me as a donor to the Green Party's Coordinated Campaign Committee. That's super easy to do, www.gp.org slash CCC. Stands for Coordinated Campaign Committee. And I bet uh, executive producer Michael O'Neill has probably already uh, dropped that link in. And I bet that somewhere on the bottom of the screen, you actually have a place that you can go to. Fantastic. And so, uh, Michael, remind me what's next. Oh, fantastic. I am so excited. And uh, folks, I am embarrassed that I forgot because this is uh, really exciting because I had an opportunity to uh, pre-record an interview with Lisa Savage, who's running for U.S. Senate in Maine. Uh, I personally think that this may be uh, the single most exciting campaign in the United States for the Green Party because she's the first statewide candidate to be in a ranked choice voting election. But wait, there's more. She's going to be in not one, not two, not three, but all four televised debates. Maine, get ready for Lisa Savage, and let's listen to the interview now. Howdy, folks. I am so excited for this next interview. I'm going to be talking to the single most exciting Green Party candidate that is anywhere on the ballot in this election cycle. That's right. I'm talking about Lisa Savage, who is running for U.S. Senate in Maine with ranked choice voting. Lisa Savage, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. You know, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about who is Lisa and why do you do what you do? Well, thank you. I've just retired from 25 years of teaching school in Maine. I was a union negotiator for several years for my uh, local teachers, you know, local bargaining unit. I'm a grandmother. I've been organizing around climate and militarism and the federal budget and militarism for many years. And I have grandchildren, so I'm worried about the future, and uh, that motivates me to run. And so you chose to run for U.S. Senate. Talk about that. Well, uh, Susan Collins is the most unpopular senator in the country right now, so we have a very unpopular incumbent. We have ranked choice voting for this election. Uh, the Democrats nominated a very centrist uh, corporate candidate who does not favor Medicare for All or a Green New Deal or many other of the policies that I favor. So it seemed like an opportunity under ranked choice voting to really show uh, what a third party candidate can do. So let's dive into the campaign because there's some exciting things going on. First, ranked choice voting makes it exciting for Greens like me to be wanting to support you. Uh, but there's some really exciting news about your campaign that I invite you to share. Indeed, there is. We're invited to all four debates. The first televised debate is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in the Eastern Time Zone. It's sponsored by three media outlets here in Maine. One is the NBC affiliate in Portland, Maine. They're called News Center Maine, WCSH. Also, the Portland Press Herald, which is the big daily newspaper for Portland, and the Bangor Daily News, uh, uh, Maine's other big city. So those three are sponsoring it. And those journalists will be moderating the debate and asking questions. There's another independent in this race, so there'll be four of us up on the debate stage. And I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to speak directly to Maine voters and give them a chance to compare me side by side with the candidates that are multimillionaires, have raised tens of millions of dollars, and have been flooding the airwaves with very negative advertising about each other, as if it weren't a ranked choice voting race. There's no reason to alienate the supporters of other candidates because you want their number two or number three ranking. 
So our strategy has been to run a very positive issues-based campaign and, and respond to what people are saying they need. So Lisa, you literally set us up for the next question, and that is, what are the issues that you're running on in this Senate race? Well, when I talk to people around Maine about what they need, health care comes up a lot. Uh, one in four lost their jobs when the pandemic hit, and many oh, of them. You just say one in four Mainers have lost their job. Well, one in four employed Mainers lost their jobs when the wow. pandemic hit. Yes, and so thousands of them lost their health care at the same time, and that's not fair. And they're very concerned about health care in a pandemic, and they're also very concerned about jobs and the economy. So, uh, Medicare for all is a very popular. Um, program here in, in, in Maine, the majority say that they welcome it. And of course, we know that the majority nationwide want it. Um, the Democratic candidate in this race says she wants to make the Unaffordable Care Act more affordable. Where I've been teaching in central Maine for 25 years, those people cannot afford any version of the so-called Affordable Care Act. And, um, you know, so that's a very, very important part of our platform. The other part is a demilitarized Green New Deal. We would want to create thousands of additional good union jobs by converting Maine's weapon-making manufacturing capacity to building things to mitigate climate change. Uh, Maine doesn't really have a public transportation system except very locally in a couple of the cities. We need light rail so we can get out of our cars. We need clean energy systems. All of those things would produce far more jobs, according to economists' research, and yet we continue to cling to uh, building warships for the Navy as if that would make us safer and as if it were a good jobs program. It really isn't. That's fantastic. And Lisa, I can't tell you how exciting it is to have this conversation and hear how seamlessly, easily, and frankly, gracefully and positively you lay out uh, those issues. Uh, before we let you go, I want to give you an opportunity for any final thoughts that you want to share with the Green Wave audience. Well, I do want to say that I was a Green for many years before I had to unenroll to get ballot access. We tried very hard to get on as a Green. It just was impossible by the rules in Maine. They keep third parties off. So I unenrolled. Now I call myself an independent green. I'm still green in my heart. My values and my platform remain the same. And I want to express appreciation to the many, many greens here in Maine and nationwide that have made this cam um, campaign possible. You've been so supportive and encouraging. And really, it's a team sport. I'm the spokesperson. We're all in it together. And we're in it to win it with Ranked Choice Voting. I love it. In it to win it with Lisa Savage running for U.S. Senate in Maine, ranked choice voting. Folks, for me, Lisa Savage in this campaign, that's the campaign to watch. Thank you, Lisa, and Thank good you, luck. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Howdy, folks. I am. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to the conclusion of the Green Party's Green Wave Candidate Showcase brought to you by the Coordinated Campaign Committee. I'm going to remind you again, please go to the website www.gp forward slash CCC and make a direct contribution to the coordinated campaign committee because that is an investment. It is an investment in training for candidates via webinars and conference calls. It's an investment in direct financial support to annual competitive process for the key candidates who are running anywhere in the country. And it's the direct investment in campaign school trainings where the national party collaborates directly with local and state green parties. And before you go, I want to let you know that tomorrow night, Lisa Savage's first candidate debate will take place in Maine and you can watch it live. All you have to do is RSVP at Lisa's website. It's very easy. Lisa for Maine dot org. Michael will drop that both into the comments and into the chat. So please do that. I also want to invite you to join me and Green Party of the United States co-chair Gloria Matera and Jessica Alvarez Parve to have a webinar on how to enact the Green New Deal. That's in partnership with Transition U.S. It will be September 16, 11 a.m. Pacific, 
2 p.m. Eastern. Mike, that will be in the comment section. You'll also be getting an email on that soon. So I want to conclude by saying thank you so much to Craig Cayetano, to Paul Patino, to Howie Hawkins, to Lisa Savage, and a shout out to Green Party staffer extraordinaire Michael O'Neill, who helped to make all this happen. And most importantly, thank you for the work that you're doing to ensure that the Green Party continues to get larger stronger and better organized because if there is a future it will be green peace so i am lisa savage i'm a candidate for the u.s senate seat currently held by susan collins it's a ranked choice voting election and the primary is tuesday so we don't know who our democratic opponent will be yet but we're pretty sure it's going to be a very corporate candidate who takes money from corporations and their lobbyists and the PACs that launder that money. I have pledged as an independent green candidate to accept no donations from corporations, corporate executives, corporate lobbyists. And so I aim to be a voice for the people of Maine in the US Senate. I have been, I'm just retiring from 25 years of teaching school in low income rural Maine. And I have seen even before the pandemic, the families of the children that I work with struggling to survive in an economy that has thrown them under the bus while CEO salaries have gone through the roof. Most of these families are hardworking and they care for their children and they do their best, but they are one accident or illness away from uh, the collapse of their economic arrangements. Um, now that the pandemic has set in, school was canceled, people are, um, you know, struggling to pay the rent and keep food on the table. Um, I think that the pandemic didn't create these conditions, but it has shown a light on the stark uh, income inequality in our country and here in the state of Maine. And um, I aim to go to the Senate and be a voice for the people. Um, I've been organizing around climate justice and the particularly calling attention to the effects of the uh, military on climate for many years here. I've been engaged in a coalition uh, waging a conversion campaign asking that our industrial capacity be repurposed to build solutions to climate crisis rather than building weapon systems that exacerbate climate crisis. I also favor a $15 minimum wage. Uh, solving the student debt crisis so that the uh, young people can, um, you know, start their lives and uh, start a family, build a house, and uh, complete their educations without being burdened with debt for the rest of their lives. I do support expanded, um, improved Medicare for all, a universal single-payer health care system, such as all the other wealthy nations have. We've seen how important that leadership could have been to have a national health uh, service at the helm during this pandemic and how much the U.S. has floundered as uh, because we lack that kind of system. And um, I call for a demilitarized Green New Deal because as uh, my uh, fellow candidates here have mentioned, without defunding the Pentagon and without a, a fair tax on the wealthy, we will not be able to find the money for um, any of these social programs. However, the savings in a Medicare uh, for all program would be uh, approximately 30%, it looks like. And the Pentagon really, at this point, gets about 70% of the discretionary federal budget each year. It shows on the books as maybe 54 or 55%, but they hide all the um, nuclear weapons in the energy department uh, budget line. And also the Veterans Administration is its own budget line. I'm certainly not uh, in favor of defunding uh, the Veterans Administration, but I do think we need a realistic accounting of exactly how much American taxpayers uh, devote to the to the military project each year. Obviously, I'm very pro-education. Um, I think that education, public education has been underfunded my entire lifetime, and I would like to see free public higher education as well. I don't think that students should be graduating from a state university with a mountain of debt. So I thank the Green Party very much for your support and for your time today. We're in it to win it. And under ranked choice voting, we really have a shot at electing a senator for people, planet, and peace. Um, our website is lisaformain.org. So check us out and we'd love to have you on the team. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the organizers of the Green Party Presidential Nominating Convention for inviting me to speak here with you. It has been a long-standing safari tradition of my family to service others. 
I fought to improve our community's groundwater systems away from toxic plumes, saltwater intrusion, and E. coli. I fought to help save our surface water ecosystems from plastic, raw sewage, dioxins, and other calamitous pollutants. But while I've done everything I can at home, the status quo in Washington has been just that, a status quo. I am running for Congress because I am renting the earth from my children. I, as a father in our community, know how challenging it is to provide safe, constructive experiences for children during a pandemic. Parents cannot compromise on healthy and peacefully stimulating environments to transition our families to. Most of our government officials have been assuming the status quo is the answer you need. Governor Cuomo won't enact the stock transfer tax, which would provide $8 billion to needed local school districts following the revenue loss caused by the pandemic. Cuomo doesn't want to raise taxes on his billionaire contributors and has avoided any discussion about the stock transfer tax solution. Instead, he is cold-heartedly betting on low and middle-income people living in frontline communities, picking up the tab instead of the profiteering billionaires. Congresswoman Kathleen Rice has voted in support of every military budget increase, voted unfavorably in response to Trump's increasing authority over the military, and has never signed on to the Green New Deal. If elected, I will serve our people in ways that most people never have the courage to. If elected, I will prescribe a COVID-19 economic stimulus package that embraces the Green New Deal, a commitment to transition to zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, combined with an economic bill of rights that raises the living standards for all Americans. This would include a guaranteed living wage job and income, single payer health care, and the right to quality housing and free education, including college. A recent study by Oxford University shows that a green economic stimulus is far more cost effective in creating jobs than traditional infrastructure projects. Climate change poses an existential threat to the future of life on the planet. The two corporate parties have wasted the last three decades. We need to radically transform our country's energy and political system in the next decade. The House Democratic leadership this week proposed another three decades for a partial reduction in emissions, while the GOP focuses on prom- protecting the profits and wealth of the fossil fuel industry and the financial backers. Even more progressive Democrats like AOC have failed to call for a halt a new fossil fuel infrastructure or a ban on fracking. The Democrats still focus on on increasing profits for private investors with schemes like carbon capture and sequestration and promotion of biomass helping factory farming. In 2012, our city of Long Beach, New York was inundated with raw sewage and tens of thousands of us were displaced as a result of Superstorm Sandy. Democrats just give this issue lip service, including the need to help third world countries survive the crisis industrial polluting nations have caused. Mind you that low income and frontline communities have always been disproportionately and negatively impacted by this perpetuating climate crisis, COVID-19 and police brutality. If elected, I will fund our Green New Deal proposals with a 75% cut in the military budget, higher taxes on the wealthy, and a robust, robust carbon tax starting at at least $40 a ton And I hope that you share this campaign and join us as we raise high the banner of social justice principles, protecting the quality of our environment and human rights to change the world now. Please join our cause at josephnaham.com. When the Green Party of Utah asked me to run, it definitely appealed uh, because I'm doing a lot of the work that I believe the world uh, needs already. And I believe that through the political transformation that this country needs, we're able to better elevate Um, the solutions that are really all around us. Um, I think it's really important that more and more political people that choose to run are ecologically educated and know what it's going to take to heal the soils, protect the water, protect the air, and also really encourage um, a culture of of mutual aid, a culture of taking care of each other, a a culture of resiliency. Uh, Running for county mayor is a really big seat. This is the capital county, serves over 1.1 million people. And it's a really amazing opportunity to be able to pull um, Salt Lake County together and share a vision of what I like to call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Uh, So much would change for us when it comes to social justice, political transparency, and ecological health if we really take the time to focus on the foundations for what creates a truly healthy, uh, really healthy world and healthy people, which is really founded in the way we interact with our environment. Uh, Coming from the background of an urban farmer and gardener, I've been advocating for those types of solutions for the last nine years. I've started nonprofits and I work uh, diligently to help people learn how to grow their own food. Uh, I believe Salt Lake County could produce uh, 40 to 50% of its own calories. Uh, We have a big 
heritage, a pioneer heritage, so to speak, here in the county, uh, where we used to produce almost all of our own food um, as uh, Mormons and even further back with the indigenous people um, of this uh, valley. And so I want to bring a resurgence to that and, and help people realize that if we are resilient and self-sufficient, if we're able to feed ourselves and take care of each other and untap the potential of our communities by more intentionally coming together and sharing resources uh, for a brighter world. Um, this vision, uh, by running for such a large seat and for putting my heart into this, um, I believe those uh, those visions, those programs, those um, the, the way that we're creating those changes are going to be elevated and it's a no it's a no lose scenario it's a great opportunity to be running for the green party i believe that um, the two-party system is unable to produce the kinds of systemic changes that we need in the world and so the energy of this campaign is meant to create change now um, regardless of the outcome and also to be a pioneer for more millennials more progressives more people even with tattoos to step into the field and say there's a better vision out here and we need to be authentic and we need to be uh, transforming the political system getting money out of it bringing transparency back i'm running against a, an incumbent centrist democrat um, that just doesn't have the capacity to make the bold changes that we need in the world so thank you for this opportunity for uh, having me here today um, I'm Ann Wilcox. I'm running for a city council at large seat in Washington, D.C. Um, it's an open it's an open seat this year because one of our members is, is stepping aside. So I, along with uh, three other ballot candidates and a number of independent candidates are running for the seat. Um, I'm a longtime member of the Statehood Party. And back in the 1970s and 80s, we founded the Statehood Party to push for statehood after our home rule, which is limited home rule, was given to us by Congress. And we did have city council members with the statehood party back in those days. Then in the 1990s, the statehood party merged with the Greens. So we're now called the statehood Green Party and have continued to maintain our ballot status through this entire time. Uh, we haven't gotten back on the city council, but we have had two uh, school board members. And I was one of those school board members who served for a, a four year term. And we've had a number of uh, neighborhood commissioners who are all statehood Greens. So we've had some success on the local level. Um, my own background, I'm uh, from Ohio originally, another Midwesterner, but I came to Washington, D.C. as a student, really liked uh, D.C., and went to law school here. So I'm a longtime public interest lawyer. I've done, you know, landlord-tenant uh, law, worked with protesters quite a bit. I'm active with the National Lawyers Guild, which is another fellow traveler organization for the Greens, um, and uh, have been a longtime community activist, as well as serving on the school board, as I, as I mentioned. Um, the uh, program we're running on this year, the platform, is of course center statehood because DC is making some progress toward achieving statehood. We had a vote in the House of Representatives just a couple of weeks ago, which is the first time the statehood bill has ever passed in the Congress. Now, of course, the Senate will be an uphill battle, and then it had the bill would have to get signed by the president, uh, which of course this president would never do, but there is some hope for the future. Um, the State of Green Party is also our progressive party for D.C., so of course we oppose gentrification, which is becoming a huge problem here, as well as in places like San Jose. Um, we're for affordable housing, uh, more health, health equity. Uh, we propose a Green New Deal platform, which is energy conservation and all of those issues, and basically opposing the rampant development, which most of our uh, political power power brokers are very much behind developers and they're funded by developers. So uh, for example, this week I put out a press release calling for some of that development money, which really is subsidized by the city council to be shifted over to funding public housing repairs because public housing is falling into disrepair and children are living in you know, conditions of mold and vermin and so forth. So we need to put more money into our public housing and shift money away from some of those development projects. So that's kind of what we're, what we're about, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. This is really exciting time. I mean, we're in the middle of a, a net global pandemic, and we're still campaigning on progressive values as a way to show the community what perhaps we were missing. So again, my name is Jake Tonkel. I'm running for city council here in San Jose, California, specifically for District 6, which covers the west side of San Jose and is particularly impacted by our development and growth, especially coming up where we have Google creating one of its largest new campuses right on the edge of the district. And then as we discuss how high-speed rail for California makes its way into San Jose and then into the Bay Area. 
so we have really centered this progressive coalition, you know, like you said, gathering support from many of our local labor organizations, um, the Green Party, and, and even many Democratic clubs in Santa Clara County. We've centered this coalition around equity for the city of San Jose and for the district. Uh, as a city that has almost 94% zoned for single family residential, we're one of the largest but most sprawled cities in the country. And as we develop, especially around some of these new projects, gentrification and displacement are becoming more and more of an issue that we are really failing to rise to the occasion of and prevent. Um, we have in San Jose, the fastest growing inequality of any city in the country. And in Santa Clara County, which we reside in, uh, home to the largest gender pay gap and the largest wage theft of any county in the country as well. So we are continually struggling with kind of the epitome of inequity with tech and then low wage workers where four out of every, four low wage jobs exist in San Jose for every one low wage housing unit. We're really struggling to make sure people can stay here. And until we make changes to represent people, uh, implement publicly funded elections, things like ranked choice voting, overhaul our community to, um, engagement process so that we can get more voices at the table when we decide what development looks like, we're gonna continue to struggle as a city. San Jose uh, sits in a, a space where we don't even talk about uh, Democrat versus Republican very often because the council is uh, generally and the Bay Area generally very democratically run, but we do have labor versus chamber as the divide for city council. Uh, right now we are on the edge where the business uh, development sector has six votes versus five votes that are progressive in labor. And we're up against uh, you know, one of the more conservative members on council. This is the opportunity for us not only to change how district six and its residents interact with the office and get to have a voice uh, on city council, but for the city as a whole, flipping this seat will have massive implications for how we move forward, for how equity is pushed uh, at city hall. And I'm extremely excited to be able to continue that conversation through the next few months on to November. My state rep office runs along eight mile road made famous by M&M but Ferndale also has a distinction of having uh, Affirmations, which is a lead LGBT organization here in Michigan. I can walk one house to the right and I can see its front door. Uh, the seven communities that I'll be running in are all familiar with me. I've been exploring this for a year and a half, attending their city council and commission and township board meetings school district meetings before and since I was running for the State Board of Education. I learned so much about education in Michigan that I wanted to use it somewhere and state representative is a natural because they're supposed to be funding it according to the Michigan Constitution. What is also, there are so many things tied in with education. I have a four leaf clover symbol I'm running with. So it's public education, it's public transit, it's prison reform, and it's protecting families, and all of that is so intertwined. I did some research, and Michigan spends $34,000 per prisoner per year. For that amount of money, someone can attend University of Michigan tuition, books, and room and board for a year, or they can get one of two years of skilled trades training. Both two years would be for less than what we pay for a prisoner. And the amount of money we have per student is like less than a third of what we pay for prisoners. So we definitely need to have some reorientation of those things. What I have here with these quote lower offices is we have two people, two Greens running for county commission in those the same districts. One of them's, one of his county commission district is totally within my state rep district. So we can run together. People, we see two Greens on the ballot in those lower offices. And the other person is three square miles. She's a disabled veteran and she has much she can talk about 
She's done a line by line study of the county commission budget. We have excellent candidates and we are working together. This is what I call a farm team so that ultimately we can, we can get elected at this level and we can keep moving upwards to do more than just raise issues, but also get elected. I'm also working this time with having our candidates across the whole state go after endorsements, Sierra Club, union endorsements. If it does nothing else, it will tell them for probably the first time. So I respected the endorsements that I heard from another one of our candidates who got the AFL-CIO. I'm working on them. And they need to know we're here. They need to know that we're on the same side and they're not going to find that anywhere else. I'm also working with our Peace Action and their national organization person came around a couple of years ago and he said, you need to consider green candidates, especially for Congress, correct? And I'm sitting there saying, this is what I'm doing here, letting them know that the Green Party exists and it is an option. So as you can tell, I am just excited about the possibilities that we can do at these local offices. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks for coming. Hope you all are well. I am Dr. Justin Paglino. I've never run for office before. As Gloria said, I come from a medical and a science background. Uh, I have an MD and I have a PhD in virology. I'm here because I believe we all deserve health care. And I want to work to see that we get Medicare for all. Today in America, many go without needed drugs, doctor's visits, or surgeries simply because they can't afford them. Many go bankrupt just trying to pay their medical bills, many of these people with health insurance. Under Medicare for all legislation, everyone would get health care. Any person would be able to go to any doctor or hospital and get care, but all the charges would be paid by a single payer, Uncle Sam. How much would this cost? Less. A recent scientific review of the studies on this question show that Medicare for all would be less expensive than our current system, up to 15% cheaper, saving us up to $500 billion a year. So we really need to do this and we really have no excuse not to extend healthcare to all Americans. The cost, again, which would be less, could be covered using our progressive income tax system. That's how I prefer to have it funded. The Medicare for All Act of 2019 has not been brought up for a debate by the House leadership, despite having support from two out of three Americans, 85% of Democrats, and having 118 co-sponsors in the House. My representative is not one of those 118 co-sponsors, but I would be. When I'm on the ballot, Medicare for All will be on the ballot. There are many other issues I am passionate about, but I know that the skills I've developed from my science career could be applied to addressing all these issues uh, that any issue that a congressperson has to face. Medicare for all, ranked choice voting, which is a simple electoral reform that would open up democracy to more than just two parties that I'd like to talk about more if there's time, clean energy, a fair economy, spending our tax dollars on our welfare, not on unnecessary warfare, diligent science-based public health. These are all things I stand for, believe in, and have passion to fight for. Thank you very much. The bulk of my campaign to this point has been conducted during a pandemic and a lockdown, so a lot of things to think about. Um, first of all, I would go back to the single-payer health care um, and not so that health care and health insurance, rather, is not tied to your employment. Because with all the jobs that have been lost, people have also lost their health insurance. Second, I would advocate for a universal basic income of $2,000 a month. Uh, the $1,200 once is simply not enough. Um, the unemployment benefits are simply not enough. So a universal basic income. Unlimited sick pay. Um, the people who are working, say, in the meatpacking plants in the Midwest, they wanted those um, meatpacking plants to be shut down because there was a, it was COVID-19 was rampant and the president ordered them back. And then the governors of a couple, governor of one state said, well, if you don't go back during the pandemic, we'll, consi we'll consider that a mandatory quit. So you lose all your benefits. No worker, unemployment benefits rather, no worker should have to make that kind of choice. Either I'm gonna stay home and I won't have benefits, I can't put food on the table, or I'm going to go to work and I'm going to get sick. So unlimited sick pay, 
personal protective equipment if people need it. Um, Amazon is a case in point. Bezos is making money hand over fist. The, these large corporation owners should not be profiting from a situation that's bad for their, their workers and employees. And then lastly, or two last things, um, elimination of student debt, not forgiveness of the interest for the next, or putting the interest on hold for these months, elimination of student debt, elimination of the rent, cancellation of the rent and mortgages, for these last three or four months? Because how are people going to pay what they owe and keep current once the, once the pandemic is done? And then we need to address the prisoners and the detainees in ICE facilities. Um, we've been fighting, like, fighting very hard here in New Jersey to have the ICE detainees released because they, can't, they, they have to buy a bar of soap, for heaven's sakes, and they live right on top of one another. and um, they, can't, they can't physically distance. And then we have to deal with our homeless situation because those folks aren't covered by the CARES Act. They're not covered by anything that Washington does. And as a U.S. Senator, I would make sure that happened. Since before the COVID, 78% um, of the people live from a paycheck to a paycheck. 50% of the people doesn't have $500 in case of emergency. 12% uh, of the people live under the fixed uh, poverty line. And then the, the COVID thing started with the lockdowns and the shutdowns of the economy and uh, the lack of the uh, earlier assessment of the COVID. What is happening now is uh, we reach a point that 40 million people are without jobs. 41% of small businesses are being destroyed. And when we look at the stimulus bill, uh, we could see there's nothing for the small businesses. 4.5 trillions went a giveaway for big corporations and for small businesses. It's only one month worth of payroll and it is a loan if they can keep their employees. So one month out of four months. So this is what they give for small businesses. And I think uh, you've, you've heard like last week about the PPP loans, how the rich people also use that. Uh, the thing is the uh, bonus of the unemployment insurance is gonna end this month. The moratoriums and on evictions and foreclosures ended last month. We are heading toward a disaster, but nobody's talking about it because at least 50% of those who are employed, unemployed right now, cannot live without that bonus and we don't have it right now. So first, we need to fix the small businesses economy and extend the bonus until we can uh, uh, revive those small businesses and create more jobs. Second, we need to demand an investigation about what's happened because I've looked at the uh, statistic coming from um, um, different uh, states and for the whole country. There's like an artificial steep in the deaths and when you analyze it, it's coming because of protocols happened mainly to manage the, the uh, the the elder uh, older population that has died and knowingly that happened and within three weeks of the time that means it is a mismanagement it's not naturally a spread of the disease when you look at the, the epidemiology models so this this artificial steep of deaths need to be investigated artificially i think um in como um just like push those seniors who are who are diagnosed into their seniors' homes, it just like go kill your friends. So this is what happened. And with the use of ventilators, you know, eight out of ten people would die from ventilators, even if they're not sick. But they did it anyway without any prior studies. Even if uh, some um, warnings came out of, from Italy from the beginning, it was like uh, following the whole issue. So they came, they, had, they never acted upon them. So we need to investigate what's happened. I'm Harry R. Berger, and I'm running for Congress on Long Island. I believe the people deserve a representative in government who will truly represent their interests. And the only way that's possible is when the candidates accept zero dollars from corporate sources. I make it clear at every opportunity that mine is a 100% people-powered campaign. Neither of my opponents make that commitment anywhere that I can find easily. The people deserve truly universal health care. 
out of over 50 nations considered highly developed by the United Nations, we're the only one that lets people become billionaires by medical extortion. It's literally your money or your life. Who benefits from that system? It's not you and it's not me. It's big insurance, big pharma, and other businesses who want you to be dependent on them to afford good health insurance. They get rich, then they use bribery with extra steps to make it technically not illegal to put lots of money into campaigns for either incumbent politicians who support the status quo or challengers to those incumbents who would threaten their fortunes. Military manufacturers do the same thing until we're spending more than twice as much on war as the next 10 nations combined. Back in college, I was in the Army ROTC program for two years until I decided that I don't want the story of my life to be about death and I left. At the same time, I also said no to designing machines that just kill people. Now for a mechanical engineer on Long Island, that mean, meant passing up most of my job opportunities, including the ones that paid the most. I want to use one problem to solve the other. Big cuts to the war budget, I say at least 50%. If we cut the budget, military budget by 50%, we're still spending more than the next 10 countries together. That's more than enough. And we can use, that money, transfer that budget over into having uh, universal health care. And uh, one very important thing is I want to make sure that Congress is on the level with someone having not even a penny to their name. That's how we make sure that it's good health care for everybody. So vote burger for Congress in November. We'll have a government that kills fewer people with a healthy population. My website is burgerforcongress.com.